Hello again, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Cotton Grower Magazine's Cotton Companion Podcast. It's early March, and depending on where you're located, you may be planting or you're getting ready to plant corn or maybe some other crops. You may also be waiting for fields to dry out. Or if you're on the high plains of Texas, you may be dealing with the aftermath of some pretty nasty high-velocity windstorms uh, over the last week or so. I'm Jim Stedman, editor of Cotton Grower, and joining me is my good friend and associate, Beck Barnes. Beck, it's a, it's a little too early to plant cotton at this point, but based on what we saw and heard at the Mid-South Farm and Gin Show, uh, prospects for, for 2023 may not, may not be a bit, well, may be a bit better than anticipated with a little bit of luck. Yeah, yeah. It is getting to be planting season. I know those guys, I was home, I went down to a crawfish boil in the Mississippi Delta this past weekend, and I know some of those guys across the river and in the lower delta, those, you know, those corn planters are are rocking and rolling, and uh, cotton will be far behind. But uh, the gin show uh, itself, Jim, you mentioned, uh, first thing I'd say about the gin show, boy, it was felt good to be in a crowded gin show again. Uh, you know, I mean, it felt like pre-pandemic gin shows where, you know, there's, there's 18, 20,000 people coming through the door and, and uh, kids are sword fighting with yardsticks. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's a, it's good energy. It's a fun environment. And, uh, I was happy for, uh, Tim Price and the folks at Southern Cotton Jenners to have that big crowd with them again. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, Joe Nicosia gave his speech that morning and, uh, very dynamic, a comprehensive talk about all the factors that are impacting uh, cotton and the price of cotton this year and felt like a mixed bag. I, one thing that stuck out to me, Jim, was heard him say that he was uh, had been prepared two weeks prior to stand up there on that stage as whatever capacity, some sort of vice president in the Cotton Council and look those farmers in the eye and tell them they probably didn't need to be planted a whole lot of cotton this year. But but the recent price rallies and uh, a couple of the other uh, factors have him, you know, a little more bullish than, as you alluded to, Jim, a little more bullish on cotton uh, than he might have been several weeks prior. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Joe is not known to sugarcoat things. So when he says, uh, you know, won't, won't be a, won't see prices like we saw in 22, obviously, but uh, ought to be, you know, you ought to be able to scratch out some profits this year. I think that's, uh, I, I take that as a positive. Yeah, I do too. Obviously, there were some watchouts that he, uh, you know, that he he touched on in his presentation. You know, there are factors obviously out there in the market, or that could uncontrollable factors in the world that could impact this market. And you know, obviously, it's something that uh, that we will be keeping keeping an eye on as well as the rest of the cotton community at this point going into it. But now, like you said, Gin Show was very very busy. I mean, we uh, we were fortunate to and, and honored to actually present our Cotton Grower Cotton Achievement Award to to this year's recipient, Mr. Jimmy Sanford from Prattville, Alabama. Jimmy was uh, and his family came up uh, to Memphis. Uh, we had a room full of what I would call cotton dignitaries. Uh, yeah. There to, uh, to join us and, uh, and to be there. A lot of Jimmy's friends and associates, uh, a lot of people from, from industry organizations and, and, uh, and others who who just wanted to uh, to be part of 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 the presentation. Yeah, heavy Alabama presence in the room, which was which was, was. wonderful. Yeah, we loved seeing uh, a lot of his grower uh, contemporaries and peers, and friends from the state of Alabama, made up a, a big section of the room. But yeah, you're right. It was it uh, there was a lot of association leads and other folks in the room and. Yeah, when you when you draw in that type of crowd, those type of industry leaders in the room, boy, that speaks so highly of uh, Mr. Jimmy. You know, those those type folks wanted him to know that they were there to support him and congratulate him. So it was a great deal. It does, and and to me, it it the fact that we had six former recipients of the award there with us, uh, I still I think speaks volumes to uh, you know about the program and. Uh, about this this excl- this this group of individuals who over the years have uh, have received the award and uh, and want want to be there to bring in, you know to help usher in the uh, the newest recipient. Uh, not only did we have folks from the mid south, but you know we had folks a couple winners from uh, from Alabama who came over 
Sean Holiday, who's Sean Holiday, yeah, current NCC chairman, who was there for a presentation. You know, he's a past winner. We were glad to have Sean in there, and Ronnie Lee, who won the award two years ago out of Georgia. I discovered comes to the Gin Show every year, anyway. Yeah. So it was good. It was good to have representation from Georgia all the way to Texas. Yep. Uh, as far as the winners were concerned, uh, just it, it was a, it was a great event. We really enjoyed doing that. But uh, just to kind of move ahead on this now, uh, if you've been listening closely to our last two episodes on the Cotton Companion, uh, you may recall that March 31st is a very important date for the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. In fact, 2023 is shaping up to be a very interesting year for the protocol. And to give us some insight about the current status of the protocol and why the end of March is so important, we're going to be joined in just a couple minutes by Tillman White. He's Program Operations Manager for the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. Uh, this program continues to be a really fascinating venture. We're looking forward to that discussion. Uh, so let's just stay tuned here for a couple of minutes. But Beck, as I am wont to do from time to time, I found something, I found an article this morning that is just too good not to share. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, first of all, Beck, you're not a, you're not a motorcycle rider, right? No, I but have you a, are, I have, you, are, you are a cyclist. I'm a, I have a road bike, meaning I pedal it, but no, I'm not okay. a, I'm not a motorcycle guy. Okay. And, and sometimes when, you know, if, when the unavoidable happens and you end up going down, with the bike. The bike goes down with, there's a certain amount of pain involved in that, correct? I can verify. Yes. Yeah. And if, and for a motorcycle, it just gets even worse because you're, you're traveling at a, at a little bit higher velocity, velocity. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's fair. This just came across my inbox this morning and I just found it too fascinating to, to ignore because out of Sweden, after four years of research, a Swedish fashion tech company has unveiled what they call MoCycle airbag jeans, the safest motorcycle jeans in the world. They uh, basically protect the lower body, including your hips, tailbone, knees, and thighs, with an airbag to reduce the risk of injury. Now, the airbag is built into the jeans. I think it's, you got to stop and think about that for a minute. Yeah, I got a lot of questions, but I'm going to let you keep going here. <laughs> it's, as it says, they the to connect the jeans, you uh, the riders tie a mechanical trigger belt to the back side of the motorcycle. <laughs> okay. And that belt buckles into the into the thigh of the pants, connecting the rider to the motorcycle. So you are as one. Okay. Okay. The airbag will deploy within milliseconds of being triggered. It activates when the rider is physically removed from the motorcycle at a force of approximately eighty-eight pounds per second. A week. A multi yeah, a multi-directional ball will detach and trigger a spring-loaded piston that pierces a CO2 cartridge and activates the airbag. The airbag self-deflates after it's activated and it can be refilled and reused with a new CO2 cartridge. Okay. I, I I'm sold, to be honest, after listening to that explanation. I, I am interested. Yep. I do wonder, you know, could you just wear some some um Picture in the Michelin Man, right? Who had the who had the big fluffy <laughs> uh, situation? That is the first thought that came to my mind yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, could you just go? But, could you uh, start out in the Michelin Man suit? Is is my question. But barring that, I guess I guess you wouldn't look. You know, bikers, motorcyclists have a certain degree of coolness and toughness uh, associated. Right. So, they, so they don't want to well, look like and, the Michelin Man. And my and my fear too is if you go with the whole Michelin Michelin Man situation, you're you know, you're you're really kind of limiting your your cotton. That's true. Uh, That's true. Yeah, we yeah. contributions yeah. to this because you know these jeans are made what they call armolith denim. It's a patented abrasion resistance material that's fifty seven percent cotton. So we've got the, the cotton denim good cotton bits involved in this. Ten percent lycra. So you've got some expandability that you're obviously going to need when these airbags go off, and uh, and thirty three percent of another ultra high polyethylene or product similar I, I to me it just sounds like it's similar to Kevlar to, to a certain extent so you know they look like they look like denim jeans but they you know they inflate and probably have uh, you know some of the same type of protection that you know I would the only, the only thing I can draw you know a comparison to maybe you know Batman's suit in the movies 
We got sounding cooler by the minute here. Sounding cooler by the minute. I'm thinking of Robert Antishak, who was a guest here on the podcast, how he would feel about that specific blend. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would say, say let's, Jim. I'm sold. I, I will Google uh, my pair. Of, I wonder if they have all that padding. Would they help me with my, uh, you know, for those of us who have kind of a narrow uh, backside, would they, could they help uh, shape, you know, uh, in the back? Uh, you're basic. You're basically asking for a special airbag, specialized <laughs> airbag, certain locations that that you really you really don't need to have an accident in order to inflate. Is that what I'm hearing yeah. back? Yeah, yeah. You know, might might uh might help me fill out my, my blue jeans. <laughs> <laughs> I think we better walk away from this discussion yeah. <laughs> at this point and then move ahead. Well, now we want to get to the topic of the day. And I'd like to welcome Tillman White, who is Program Operations Manager for the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol, into our virtual studio. Uh, it's good to visit with you again, Tillman. Welcome to the Cotton Companion. Thank you for having me. I know you're in the process right now of wrapping up the 2022 year for the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. Can you give us a quick update on how far the protocol has come since it started in 2020? and where the program really stands today in terms of membership and, and activities. Yes, sir, I can. So um, to, to your first point, enrollment's still open for, for the 2022 enrollment. We're, we're looking to end that in the end of March of 2023, so there's still time for our producers to go in there and enroll into the process. But looking back since the program was launched back in 2020, we've able been able to double enrollment just about each year for our producer members. So back in 2020, we had around 300 growers enroll into the process, enter some data um, on their operation. And in 2021, we're able to capture a little over 600. So since the the programs have been in place in 2020, we've, we've seen enrollment numbers increase and hopefully to continue to see that number increase for 2022 enrollment as well. Now, I noticed uh, what's kind of been the interest level for audiences beyond the farm gate and the gin. I mean, when I look at the numbers, I see a lot of mills, manufacturers, and retailers that have come on board. Um, what's what's in it for them from the protocol? So um, at the start of the program, that's really where the big push was is from our end-use customers. A lot of our brands and retailers were, were under pressure from NGOs, stakeholders within the company, um, even consumers, where they needed to provide um, information of where they're sourcing their fiber. So they needed to not only see, you know, how that product is made, but where it goes throughout the supply chain. And that's really where the, that big push stemmed from is our brands and retailers. So um, initially, that's where we saw our brands uh, jumping on board. And the mill manufacturer number you see is, is so large. I think we're around 1,200 mill manufacturers across the world. It's, it, those brands needed to get their supply chain within these systems. So not only could they say by sourcing to the protocol, they could see what kind of it impacted on, on the environment, but how is it handled throughout the supply chain? You know, as we know in the cotton industry, there's so many different moving parts. You know, once that cotton is grown, as it goes to, it's sold to a mill manufacturer, lay down the blending process. So it was important for the brands and retailers to get their supply chain within the program. Yeah, uh, Tillman, wait, you just touched on something that I had not heard b before. I want to make sure I, I understand correctly. Did you say there's 1,200 mills globally that are kind of uh, signed up and, and registered in the trust protocol? Correct. We have um, a little over 1,200 approved members in the protocol, So they've, and that includes their subsidiaries as well, but they're all members of the protocol where they can receive um, shipments of U.S. cotton and protocol cotton in, in Working with our partner Textile Genesis, they can uh, the TG system can create a digital digital token where that can track the movement of those bales. You know, once it's sold and moves throughout the different mills, because I mean, it can go from from Bangladesh to Vietnam, all the different spinning, cut and sew, dyeing mills. So that's really important for the brands. Yeah, yeah. I tell you, our our guys, our audience is mostly growers, and they're pretty savvy. Uh, they they've heard about you know kind of. The many geographical uh, spots that the downstream uh, sectors of their industry will take them, uh, but you know, I mean, beyond that, what a what a great sort of uh, indicator of the downstream enthusiasm for this uh, effort for this project. And so, but we know 
you know, it takes uh, two to tango to mangle a metaphor here. We know the growers have to be involved too, and that that is our audience. So, you know, tell me uh, if I am a uh, Joe Farmer and I've got 5,000 acres, you know, what are the advantages to me uh, for signing up and getting involved with the trust protocol? Um, I think initially, um, one thing's important is, is marketability and ensuring your, your fibers entering all markets throughout um, the entire world for their customers, for these brands and retailers, because one thing they did is create these preferred fiber lists. So by 2025, 2030, these brands have come out publicly that they're only going to source the fiber that come from these preferred fiber lists. And now that the protocol um, has been has been you know created and, and, and is now working, they've made some of that preferred fiber list. So again, I think ensures our producers are not missing on any market opportunity. Um, I think another thing that's really important a benefit for our producers is in 2023 enrollment. Um, producers can participate in the Climate Smart Cotton Program. Um, the USDA put out some funding last year for climate smart practices, and the U.S. Got Just Protocol, um, you know, sent a proposal in and um, is now having a project with that Climate Smart Program. Hopefully, in you know, opening up when 2023 enrollment opens, and that's going to provide some financial and technical assistance for our producer members up to 1,650 growers across the cotton belt to potentially adopt some climate smart practices and look into that. Um, I think a, another benefit is within the protocol is, is having as, uh, access to their own data. Um, within our platform, they can see the environmental footprint of each of their fields. They can compare their fields, see what, what areas they can improve upon or, um, you know, compare it to other fields, regional, national data. I think that's also really important for our producers as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just listening to you there, there's a lot of benefit <laughs> to to sum it up uh, succinctly. But I know that that messaging, like what you just gave me, it takes some, it takes some effort. It takes time to message, you know, what you're telling me to growers. Um, have you, are you finding that the guys are starting to, uh, come around on that generally the farmers out there in the u.s are they starting to kind of is the light bulb uh coming on for a lot of them i think so i think they're starting to hear about the program more than just from us from the council they're starting to hear from from their jenners their their marketers as well wanting them to to get involved with the protocol because you know i think some of our marketers are seeing it in the marketplace too they're wanting they're seeing some pull from those end use customers wanting to, you know, source protocol bales. So I think um, that's really important for our growers to hear it from them as well, because you know we can we can push it as much as we want, but hearing it from their generators, their marketers is is really important. We're starting to see more of that. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Um, now I know that uh, one of the sort of I don't I don't want to call it an obstacle, but one of the the uh, uh, first more involved aspects to get involved <laughs> is that uh, the farmers have to register and another registration process can take a little bit of time. So uh, have you guys found ways to kind of streamline that registration process for the growers? Yes. Um, you know, to your point, they can register uh, through our website, which they can go to trustuscotton.org. They go to the register now tab, they select their role in the industry, which would be a producer. And then they would have six enrollment steps and um, like you said, at the first initial time when producers enroll, it can be lengthy. Um, a lot of it having to do is learning how to navigate the, the program and, and know what information they have to input. But once our producers enroll that first year, we have a three-year enrollment where the years following that, they just go in and verifying if any information changes. They can update their acres for that current production, uh, that crop year. So we have streamlined some. Um, areas of the, the the protocol. And also we've added in where um, if a producer is working with the John Deere Ops Center, they can connect themselves with their account with John Deere Ops Center and pre-populate up to 40% of their data. So that's another area where, you know, we're trying to help again streamline that data input. Well, you, you mentioned March 31st, and we've talked about it here on the podcast for, for the last several episodes uh, as being a significant deadline uh, for the protocol. Why is it uh, why is it that important? What kind of inform? How many people? How much you know? How much activity do you uh, do you hope to have in place 
by that point? Because as I understand, that's the end of the 2022 season for you, correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. And um, right now we have, um, I think, 570 growers I checked this morning. Um, we're enrolled in the prep protocol, completed all their enrollment steps. So we have some of the data about their operation. Um, we have a little over a million bells from the 22 crop that's in our system as well. Um, it covers over um, a little less than one, one million acres. So we're still missing some bells from some of our producers. But um, I think we can, we can get to uh, maybe the 700 mark. Um, cause historically we've seen, you know, some guys are, are, you know, are getting enrolled right before that deadline, which is fine. We're expecting that. So that's why we're, we're still here. We're still pushing it and trying to get guys enrolled with the, to the program. So I think, I think we can hit that 700 mark or maybe even more. Yeah. Sort of like Christmas shopping on December 23rd, right? That's right. We've all been there. So <laughs> that's, that's when I get started. Yeah. Uh, Dylan, you mentioned, you mentioned the, uh, the climate smart cotton program just a minute ago and and yeah i know there's there's still a lot of things to be determined on that as as you get into preliminary discussions with growers on what that program can mean to them what kind of reaction are you are you getting from them um we're getting um some good interest um of course we're still trying to iron out the details with the usda as far as um, right. the information we can provide for the growers because um you know, we want to make sure that everything gets nailed down, but we, we are seeing some interest um, from um, our producer members, especially guys that are already members, because it's just another opportunity for our producers to, um, you know, have some type of financial benefit, but also it's um, financial benefit where they can try new practices that maybe they've never tried before and, um, you know, new opportunities and, and access to more information about those those practices that this climate smart program can offer to them. Okay. Well, as that, as that closes the book on 2022, obviously April 1 then probably opens, uh, it's New Year's Day for the protocol for 2023 at that point. Any goals, any things you'd like to see, where you'd like to see the program go uh, over the course of the next year? Any any predictions for the uh, for the protocol? Um, I think... Um, initially, I think we're, we'll be focusing on that climate smart. So I think we want to get, um, you know, the, the grants up for 1,650 U.S. farmers. I don't know if we'll be able to get all of those enrolled complete for 2023 enrollment, but um, that grants over five years. Hopefully we can, I think, get to that number the next two years. So I think that's a, that's a good goal for the program. Um, so I think doing that, and again, um, you know, getting more bells into the system to to have that supply as the again the demand increases. We're seeing more males and more brands come to the table each and every day. So, I think hopefully getting and trying to reach those those goals for the climate sports important right now. Yeah, well, I think I think it's safe to say that you've got your work cut out for you at at this point. Never a dull moment when you walk in the office, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, Tillman, thanks uh, thanks for taking some time to uh, to join us today and give us an update on the trust protocol. Uh, we obviously certainly appreciate your time at, and, and, and the, uh, and the work that you're doing and that everybody involved with you with the trust protocol is, is doing at this point. Uh, March 31st is coming up pretty quick, but, uh, as you said, and, and we agree with you, we're counting on, uh, on some good things to happen by that deadline. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you again for letting me come in today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, all right. That's going to do it for this episode of the Cotton Companion Podcast. We want to thank again uh, Tillman White for updating the status of the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol for us. And as always, we want to say thanks to you, our dear listeners, for joining us. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode, and if you like what you've heard, please be sure to spread the word. Tell your friends about the Cotton Companion Podcast. Here's where and how they can find us. You can find the Cotton Companion in three easy ways. First, go to cottongrower.com forward slash companion, or simply click the podcast tab at the top of the homepage. Second, subscribe to our channel on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts these days. And three, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, The Cotton Grower E-News, that's delivered to your email inbox every Tuesday morning. You can do that by going to cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe. Also, be sure to follow Cotton Grower on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter 
And on Facebook, you'll find us by searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. Cotton Companion Podcast is produced twice monthly by Tyler Hatch and Kim Henderson, our talented colleagues, world headquarters for Meister Media Worldwide in lovely Willoughby, Ohio. I'm Jim Stedman, he's Beck Barnes, and we'll be back with you in two weeks the next episode of The Cotton Companion. He works and he works and he works and he works all day. God made a farm.